Bruce Lawn. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our guest today really needs no introduction. I am extremely ecstatic to bring you uh, someone that's that's been a part of what we do here with Christian Hip Hop for a long time. Um, it's It's been amazing to see his journey, his willingness to uncompromise his faith. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, we have my man, Chris Boussard. Man, up, thank brother? you so much for being here, brother. Man, I'm excited, man. It's great to be on with you. I've been following you for a long time, listening to your music, being ministered to through your music and entertained through your music. So uh, it's good to be on, man. I'm excited. Man, I'm so happy you're here. So uh, I wanted to just jump in. We got Chris for about an hour, and I, I, I got a whole bunch of sports questions, but we're going to keep focused to your story, your journey, and what we're ultimately here to talk about today in this tumultuous time in our country and our history. Um, you were on ESPN for quite a few years, and there was well, a little years. bit of controversy that stirred up, uh, I think originally in 07, but it really kind of peaked in, in, in 2013. Um, can can you just unpack some of that and and one because i want you to tell a story but two because i love your posture and your heart for these sensitive issues that we're going to just jump right into well you mentioned 2007 and uh what happened then was i was writing for espn.com and i worked at espn from 2004 to 2016 and so at that time i was writing for espn.com and John Amechi, who was a former NBA player, who I actually covered, I was a beat writer for the Cleveland Cavaliers when he played for them. He came out as a homosexual after he retired. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a lot, were a lot of comments, obviously, again, this is 2007. And a lot of the media were being very critical of anyone who did anything but applaud John Amechi. Mm -hmm. Now, it wasn't just people that were critical of you, but just anybody that didn't wholeheartedly embrace and applaud um, his lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'll give you an example. If a, if a player says something like, um, as long as he doesn't, he could play on my team as long as he doesn't bring that to me or hit on me or something like that, mm -hmm. then they were getting ripped in the media. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a blog for ESPN.com stating that I'm a Christian, and I, I believe homosexuality is a sin, as I believe all sex outside of marriage between a man and woman is a sin. Uh, but we, as people in America who have different viewpoints, we have to learn how to disagree without being disagreeable, if you will. Mm, or we have to be on. able to be civil come in on. our disagreements. Mm -hmm. And I use as an example a brother that worked with me, LZ Granderson, who now writes for the LA Times, he worked with me at ESPN the magazine where I worked at the time and we were good friends. He was openly gay. Um, we played on basketball teams together in basketball leagues together. We had lunch together. I mean, we were le legitimately friends and uh, he knew I was a Christian and my stance and my views and I knew his lifestyle and his views and we we could, you know, disagree and, and know that each other, I didn't agree with his lifestyle. He didn't agree with my viewpoints and yet be friends and have no issues with each other and respect one another. And so I wrote that in a blog and the, the, this is 2007. The response to it was overwhelmingly positive. 90% hmm. of the emails and I received thousands mm -hmm. uh, about the article were positive. Even those that were from, people in the LGBT plus community. Mm. And um, it was so positively received that Mike and Mike in the morning, which was the most popular sports talk show at the time in the country, mm -hmm. they read like two thirds of it on the air. They read a large mm. excerpt from it on the air. And Mike Greenberg said at the time, it was the one of the best, if not the best uh, explanations of this situation that he'd heard. Mm. Because I was really calling for understanding and real tolerance. You know, people talk about mm. tolerance, but mm. it's those that push tolerance a lot today are mm. very intolerable or intolerant, <laughs> if you will. And so, um, you know, it was widely received in, in a positive way. Mm -hmm. And then so fast forward six years mm -hmm. to 2013 when uh, Jason Collins comes out and he was mm -hmm. actually still in the league at the time. 
Yep, I remember. And this. he came out as homosexual, so he was the first openly gay player in the NBA. And uh, I was on the on Sports Center that morning, uh, and they brought me on uh, to be a reporter. So I was just objectively, I wasn't putting my personal views in it. I was just saying what I have been hearing from players and coaches and executives around the league that I was in communication with since the announcement. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they put me later on on Outside the Lines, which is a show in which your personal views become, you know, a part of the story. Yeah. And you're able to share those more. And so unbeknownst to me, they actually put me and LZ on together, mm. beca largely because of that article that I had because written article, six years yeah. earlier. Yep. And it was no problem. I sat down in the chair 30 seconds before we hit the air and we realized LZ and I that we're both on. And, it, you know, it was like, OK, this will be good. And so the con we had a conversation. We recapped what uh, I wrote about in 2007. We recapped how we're friends, but we disagree and so on and so forth. Mm. And then I was asked uh, directly by the host. Uh, you know, Jason Collins, when he came out, he did so in an article in Sports Illustrated, mm -hmm. and he said he's a Christian. Mm -hmm. And um, so they asked me directly, do you, what do you think about that? Him, him proclaiming to be a Christian, mm -hmm. but living an openly homosexual lifestyle. And I gave uh, a biblical answer, a historic answer, because this has been the stance of the Christian church for 2,000 years. <laughs> and so I just said, look, if you're living in unrepentant sin, whatever it might be. And I, I literally said that. I didn't single out homosexuality. I said it could be adultery. It could be uh, fornication between heterosexuals. Uh, anything where you're just unrepentant, you're like, this is how I'm living and whatever. Then I wouldn't say call you a Christian. Jesus is not your Lord if you're clearly just unrepentantly not following what he's teaching you and, and what he's telling you to do. And so... Um, that, you know, is the story. And initially, again, ESPN really liked it. Uh, they called me right after the show mm -hmm. and thought it was a great discussion. Uh, we're trying to figure out how they were going to use me going forward as a commentator to get my personal views or as a reporter mm. to stay objective. Mm. And I said, I'm good with whatever. But then about an hour later is when, you know, everything broke loose and all over the media world, I was being criticized. The View, mm. uh, CNN, MSNBC, Pat Robertson talked about it. He, he supported me. He, you know, he said I gave a traditional Christian viewpoint. Uh, mm. But it was just became a big story. Spike mm. Lee was commenting, who I know Spike is a friend. Uh, Al Sharpton. Um, I was on The Breakfast Club two days later mm -hmm. uh, with Charlemagne and Envy and, and, and all of them and um, mm. Angela Yee. And so... Yeah, it, it became a big story. There was a group calling for my firing. Uh, mm. I obviously wasn't fired. ESPN was supportive. They never reprimanded me. They never hinted at, at least in discussions with me, at any type of discipline. Mm. Um, and so, you know, it, it became it became a big story. But I'll say this. It really emboldened Christians around the world. Mm -hmm. I, I heard from Christians in the Philippines, in Africa, uh, in South America, throughout the country. Uh, when I go into arenas to this very day, Christians of all races, ages, genders come up to me and thank me. And, you know, my son needed to hear that, whatever it may be. But they're very sure. thankful and grateful for me standing up like that. And um, even pe Christians within the league, players, uh, coaches, executives were really supportive and you know, it's just uncommon that we stand up like that today. Mm. And um, and sadly, even among preachers, as you know, which mm. which really baffles the mind. But What I love about the entire 2007 and the 2013 situation is that in it, you are, uh, this, this is my friend, this is my brother, there's dignity, there's respect, there's camaraderie, we play basketball together, we hang out together, right? On this specific thing, we disagree right. on, right? And so I think one, it, it, unfortunately, historically, the, the church hasn't always had that stance 
in in context of some of these conversations. Sometimes you want to just give give the hard truth without any type of dignity, respect, common ground, love, patience, mercy, grace, and you're just going in for the for you know ah oh, facts over feelings. This is what it is. Blah. You know, and it's just like I think right. I think the way you communicated that I think makes sense, and I think it's it's unfortunate that we are in a space where there is no room to disagree, right? Like I can love you and affirm you as a friend and there may be things about your life that I, I don't disagree with necessarily, right? And yeah. vice versa. And so it, it's this equation that love has to equal affirmation, that if I love you, I have to affirm everything about you. And Jesus loved everybody, but we don't ever see Jesus affirming anybody's sin right. in terms of how we are to live on this side of eternity. So I think it's interesting that now these these lines are being convoluted. This is a question from Truther from our Patreon community. You, he says, how open-minded have your peers at ESPN or Fox have been to your expressions of faith? And why do other people of faith in these spaces seem not to express it more from these platforms like you have over the years? Man, people have been cool. Um, mm. Obviously, a lot of people disagree with me, mm -hmm. but... I, I, and I speak because I speak a lot on this when I visit churches and stuff. And one thing I say is, look, when you stand up for Christ as or, and just being a believer in the workplace, in the marketplace, mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. your field of endeavor may be, mm -hmm. if you're going to stand up for Christ and let it be known that you're a Christian. And I don't recommend running in there with a Bible and beating you know people over the head with your faith. You see me on television all the time. I don't do that. But when the door is open, uh, I share my faith. I'm unashamed of it, basically. Yeah, so yeah. it just, it comes up at times. Um, and I'm just, this is who I am. Uh, yep. Just like you're who you are. Mm -hmm. But what I say to Christians is, look, if you're going to let it be known that you're a Christian and, and stand up for your faith, then you need to live it. Mm -hmm. Okay? I, I have no doubt in my mind. Now, nobody told me this. But I have no doubt in my mind that had I been at ESPN at that time and I'm up there on campus and I'm sleeping around with people on campus, makeup girls while I'm married and mm -hmm. I'm cursing all the time, I'm getting drunk, I'm getting high, but yet I'm proclaiming Jesus and all that, I think I would have been fired mm. because I think I would have been viewed as a hypocrite who uses religion to promote or cover his bigoted views. Come on. But yet, because of my walk, and I'm not saying I'm perfect, but you know, I'm not up there doing those things. You know, yep. people know yep. I'm committed, I'm faithful to my wife. You don't yep. hear me cursing and, and getting drunk and things like that. Uh, they recognize, look, we may disagree with him, Yeah. but this is who he is. This is diversity. This is his yep. belief. This is his yep. faith. Yep. And he's sincere in it. One, one person told me, who's very famous and people would know him if I mentioned his name, but I won't. He told me, and we're friends, we've been friends for over 20 years. And he told me that some of the executives at ESPN went to him and talked to him about me in this situation. And he said, look, Chris is sincere. Chris lives what he proclaims. And he said, Chris was calling me out. He's not a homosexual, but he was saying, look, Chris called out, you know, various sexual sins as the Bible describes. Them. Mm -hmm. And he was like, he's calling me out. I go to mm -hmm. church, but I'm mm -hmm. out sleeping around, you know, and, and he mm -hmm. was calling me out too. And so because I lived my faith or lived my faith in the workplace, mm -hmm. I think that protects you. And mm -hmm. so I would suggest to Christians, you know, live your faith out. Don't yeah. be hypocrite. I mean, we're called to do that anyway. It, yes. It's not like we're putting extra burdens on you. But yes. live out your faith. And, and look, we're a pluralistic society. Yep. And Christians need to state this. So we're going to disagree, not just on issues of sexuality or race mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. religion. We're going to mm -hmm. disagree about a number of things. Yep. But we're a pluralistic society, and we have to find a way to make room for all of these different viewpoints, whatever it may be. Come on. I love that. And, and I think another thing I would say is you, Chris, have always been known by what you're for 
and the work you do with your nonprofit and the 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 the, 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 the posture you have towards people and not just what you're against. I also think that's helped you because w- w- this is not uh this this is this is one story of your entire career and the vast majority of your career uh I've always known you as, as just an unapologetic follower of Jesus. You've always been supportive of Christian hip hop. You've always been supportive of non nonprofits and different charities. So I think that's also a distinction is like, you're not the guy that's like, yeah, th- this, this one thing is terrible. It's bad. It's terrible. Like, no, 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 no. Like, this is like, they asked you, you shared where your, what your position is. You kept it moving. And then you transitioned from ESPN to Fox. But from my understanding, that wasn't even a, a, a like a, a bad situation. Like your, your contract just kind of expired with ESPN. In, there was no hostility and you just moved on to Fox and you continued doing what you were doing. Yeah, I moved on to Fox Sports in 2016 mm-hmm. and my contract had expired. ESPN did offer me another contract uh, so I could have stayed at ESPN. Now they did want me they they wanted me strictly in a reporter's role. So I would do sideline reporting. I would be on Sports Center just, you know, talking about things going on in the NBA. They didn't want me to do any commentary. Mm. <laughs> so they didn't want me on anymore because I used to be a mainstay on first take before uh, Stephen A. you know, took over and joined Skip Bayless. And they were doing it until Skip went to Fox. Mm. Uh, and I would be on the first take where, again, your opinion's coming up and your personal views may, may, be, uh, be, may come out. And so they didn't want me anymore to be in roles like that. Uh, and so I think that definitely was a reaction to, you know, the things that had happened in 2013. Um, but so they wanted me as a reporter. Fox Sports wanted me more as a commentator and opinionist. And so I, I like that role better. I was ready to move on from being a reporter to moving on to that role. So that's why I left. It had nothing to do with what happened back in 2013. I have no uh, problems whatsoever with ESPN. Um, still in touch with some of the people there. So no, it was nothing, uh, untoward or anything. It was just a move I wanted to make for my career. Um, and I'm happy with it. And, and, and the interesting thing, not interesting, it's it's not surprising, but that topic doesn't even come up. I have not discussed that topic on Fox. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. it just, it's not going to come up. So even ESPN's apprehension Mm -hmm. about letting me be, uh, on the air or talking about certain things mm-hmm. is is somewhat unfounded. I've been while I was at ESPN. After that, I've been on shows with uh, athletes who were openly gay, mm-hmm. and they talked about it. And we didn't, you know, it was fine. It was no yep. no big deal, no issue. Yep. Yep. Uh, but I think it was something that I think ESPN was a little cons- worried about it. You know, mm-hmm. they never, like I said, it 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 didn't become a big deal. But I thought they were worried that, oh, Chris is going to speak his mind. And if this topic comes up, it could be controversial. I think what we say and what we stand on is just as important a lot of times with how we say these things. And so if you're going to say a hard truth, how you say it is just as important as what you're going to say. And I think that's uh, been indicative of you just being shrewd talking about some of these heavier topics and so um it, with that i want to get into some 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 of the things that we're going to talk about that's that's you know a lot of folks are probably with you right now and they're like yeah chris <laughs> right. stood up for the faith <laughs> but what we're gonna get into next uh is gonna make some of you guys uncomfortable uh i had dr eric mason on a few weeks ago uh and uh and then i did a plethora of interviews to defend having dr eric mason on my channel (laughs) for for with the uh anti anti anti-racist crowd as as i would like to call them and uh and one of the things we kind of glossed over was uh you know he his mentioning of reparations and i my my position was like yeah like that's not that wild of a concept you know (laughs) like if you understand the history of what this country is has has uh has gone through it's not that wild of a concept if you look at what other groups have gotten reparations not that wild of a concept your position is um you you're coming at it from a christian position from a from a from a biblical position so share your heart on that and uh and 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 what that uh, we we need to i want to i want you to share your heart but then i also want want, want you to uh i want to dispel some of the myths and misunderstandings of what what this entire conversation is so uh yeah i'd I'd love to hear just your, your your thoughts on all that 
Well, first, as you said, I'm coming at it from a spiritual standpoint. Now, obviously, we all live in this natural world. I'm African-American. And I do, you know, I'm concerned about just our everyday things that we deal with, uh, which reparations is a part of that. But I, I'm going to start here. I think we all would, all of us Christians, and to be honest, many Muslims and Jews as well, like Orthodox Jews, would agree that the direction our country is going in is very troublesome. Um in some ways it's getting better in some ways it's more inclusive and diverse and things like that but in a lot of ways it's troublesome for people of faith because it's all it's getting close to a point where as i said it's not about pluralism and okay christians believe this muslims believe this jews believe this you know certain people want to live this the lgbt community wants to live this lifestyle and we allow everybody to do their thing it's like now they're trying to infringe on people of faith and, and particularly the church to the point where we're, we're it's not hard to see in the future where they're going to try to have churches and any other religious groups not be able to teach according to their faith in regards to sexuality, in regards to marriage. Mm -hmm. So a Christian school might not be able to teach biblical marriage or biblical sexuality, at least the world will try to do that. So um, we're, we're very, I think we all would agree that the country's becoming more and more antagonistic toward Christianity and Christians in general. Uh, and then, like I said, you could even throw in other people of faith that try to follow their books, the Quran, the Torah, whatever it may be, because the values are similar, mm -hmm. um, the moral values. Um, and I believe that the church is missing a great opportunity mm. uh, to evangelize and also to uh, make things better for the church here in America. Mm -hmm. um, because the church is very divided along racial lines. Mm -hmm. And as you said, when you say a group has been with me for the first 15 minutes of this podcast or whatever, that's a, a, a probably a lot of white Christians. Black ones as well, but certainly white Christians. Uh, because white Christians tend, I'm not saying all, but tend to be on the right. Mm -hmm. A lot of white Christians. Black Christians, not all, but black Christians tend to be on the left. So the white Christians are on the right because of, you know, pro-life, traditional marriage, things like that. The, the black Christians are on the left because of justice, inclusivity, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. I'm saying the church is missing an opportunity because both sides have some truth and some falsehood. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if the church, white, black Christians, Christians of all races, would unite on a kingdom agenda. Come on. One that included what we call family values, traditional marriage, uh, pro-life, things like that, but also would include justice. Mm -hmm. um, love and, and empowerment of the poor, yeah. yes, inclusivity, diversity, yes. all yes. of that, then you could then unite the black Christians and white Christians and Christians of other races. And that is a powerful group yep. that could have yep. an impact on the country, not to lord over non-Christians, mm -hmm. but just to protect our space mm -hmm. and also be a light and a witness, be the salt of the earth. And so I believe that white Christians should be a loud and powerful voice for reparation and for justice. Mm -hmm. White Christians should be the loudest, most progressive voice for racial and social justice. Mm -hmm. And if they were, a lot of black Christians would be able to unite with them. But because I'm, in my opinion, many white Christians choose capitalism mm -hmm. over Christ, then, Oof. and I'm not a socialist or Marxist, anything that, like that. I'm, but I'm a Christian. Yeah. And I don't think capitalism, God threw capitalism down from heaven, even though I, I am enjoying living in a capitalistic society. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just saying that Christ should be first. And I can make a biblical case for reparations, I can make a historical case for reparations. Uh, I can make an economic case for reparations. 
And I think if the if the church was promoting that as well as the other traditional values that we mm-hmm. talked about, mm-hmm. then I think it would be powerful. It would be evangelistic because the Bible shows that in Acts chapter two, in Acts chapter four, when the church meets economic the economic needs of needs of individuals, mm-hmm. that's evangelistic. They did that in Acts two and four, and they added to the church daily. Yeah. Um, so that that's it in not even it in a nutshell, but that's one statement. If you have another question, yeah, I can no, that's go good. On, I think it's a deep topic. Yeah, I think it's good. I think I think I think one side of the coin loves the orthodoxy and the theology and the richness of the gospel, right? And historically, the black church has been about orthodoxy and doxology. It's also been about, hey, how do we live this out on this side of eternity, right? right. So you see church, or black churches being more involved in, uh, you know, in, in, in Tulsa, for example, like Wall Street, the church was involved in creating economic opportunity and having uh, banking systems and all these different things. So it's it's let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, that there is a kingdom, you know, a kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We're not just saved so that we get to heaven right. and then that's it. No, 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 no. There's, there are things that we are called to do. And I always think about Matthew chapter 25, which if we look at Matthew tw- chapter 25, uh, there's the parable talking about the virgins being prepared for Jesus coming back, which I think like we're talking end days, be prepared, Jesus could come back at any time. Then it goes into the parable of the talents, which is a very capitalistic type of parable. You know, right. he gave one five, he doubled up, he gave one three, and then he gave one one, and then the one at that's that's I mean that's capitalism, that's meritocracy, right. that's that's competition, that's those are good things. And then it goes from there, and it goes into this very interesting parable about, well, it, might, it probably isn't even a parable, but it talks about the least of these. Hey, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was in prison, you, you, you visited me. When I was naked, you clothed me. And so right. we go from live your life prepared, which is the beginning of Matthew t- chapter 25. Jesus could come back at any moment to make the most of your time, talent, and treasure on this side of eternity which is very capitalistic to, oh, and by the way, don't forget about the poor. Don't forget right. about the people that are in prison. Don't forget about the people that have had a rough hand. And so when it, when it comes to these conversations, I think a lot of this is, is, is based on our perspective. So I want to clarify a few things because I know, I, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. And well, let me, let me add this, because you mentioned the black church being about uh, orthodoxy and doxology or orthopraxy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The white church is very much about that as well, and very much about social justice mm-hmm. when it, it there are issues affecting them. Mm. Okay. Oh, the, the white church doesn't hesitate to speak out about abortion. Mm. Yeah. They didn't hesitate yeah. to speak out about same-sex marriage. Mm-hmm. You know, when uh, even you can go back into the beginning of the 20th century when unions mm-hmm. were beginning to form, mm-hmm. white evangelicals were very active in that, mm. and so. The, like, I don't think white Christians are against social justice at all when mm-hmm. it comes, and I'm generalizing. So sure, I sure, think sure. you understand yeah. the term. I'm not saying every yes. white Christian yeah. or yeah. every white Christian church. But the white church as a whole in America has been very much about justice when it affects them. They just haven't so much been about justice for black Americans in this country. Yeah. And that's so so that's where the hypocrisy comes in when you tell Af- when African Americans are told don't deal with those issues just preach the gospel. But mm-hmm. white Americans are never told that. Jerry Falwell was never told that. He was invited into churches to promote what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I, we have to be uh, again it's just being inclusive and you know treating all people equally not with partiality. Yes, I love that. And let's just dispel some myths off the rip. Uh, th- there's this big, I feel, misrepresentation. And I don't know if it's intentionally being misrep- mis- mis- misrepresentation or it's being uh, 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 j- just ignorant. So when you say social justice, we are not talking about the equal outcome of all groups. We are not talking about Ruslan should deserve to get paid what LeBron James gets paid to play right. basketball. That is not what we're talking about. So I just <laughs> want to make this really clear. We are not talking about the disruption of meritocracy, the disruption of capitalism, the disruption of the nuclear family, and let's just create perfect outcome where, where we're going to disrupt and destroy our entire... That is not what we're talking about. Right. When we're, 
How would you we define want, we want social equality justice? Equality of opportunity. Equality of opportunity. Not, Talk about that. Mean, like, for instance, let's just say hypothetically blacks were given reparations mm -hmm. and many of us wasted it mm -hmm. and spent it. Well, OK, then, then we wasted it. It's not like we're going to, you know, figure out a way, okay, we got to get this equity. It doesn't have to be equality of outcome, it's e but it's equality of opportunity is what we mm -hmm. want. Mm -hmm. That's good. Equality of opportunity. So let's talk about how opportunity has been prevented from certain groups in America. Because I think people just think, oh, there was like slavery and that like, you know, that was like, 400 years ago, you know, and it's like, nope, slavery ended 150 years ago. And there's documentation of some people remaining uh, functional slaves up until the 60s. You guys could look this oh, yeah. up. OK, so there's so, so it's not just, hey, there's slavery and then uh, 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 civil rights. And then we just made everything perfect right. with civil rights. So let's let's unpack for those folks that are here. They're 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 willing to give a lending ear. Let's talk about some of the things in between slavery uh, in, into our modern context that have negatively uh, disproportionately affected the black community. No, that's a great point and question because it's not just reparations for slavery. Mm -hmm. Okay, it is all of the things that happened after that as well. Now, slavery did build this country into the most powerful and wealthy nation, wealthiest nation that we've ever known on earth. OK, mm -hmm. it was built on cotton, rice, tobacco and sugar, which mm -hmm. were the products of sl the slave trade mm -hmm. and free labor for roughly 250 years. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, even the North benefited from where there wasn't slavery you know, after a certain period, even it benefited because it was selling the South a lot of the stuff the stuff that was necessary for slavery you know from from textiles all types of stuff so um but after slavery because you mentioned how have some of the opportunities been kept from african americans it, it, it's also that so many opportunities so many boosts uh so much help was given to white americans including european immigrants and that is the thing like a lot of whites, you know, will feel like, well, we pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And many did work hard. I'm not mm -hmm. in any way saying mm -hmm. white Americans have not worked hard for what they've gotten. But mm -hmm. they've benefited from these boosts and these laws and things that worked for them while at the same time working against African-Americans. So, for instance, right out of slavery. And let me let me start this first. You You know, of course. African Americans who had been enslaved were promised 40 acres and a mule mm -hmm. out of slavery because mm -hmm. it's common sense that you don't just release a people who have been enslaved for 200 some odd years into society with nothing mm -hmm. and expect them to be able to assimilate properly into that society. And so mm -hmm. every African American family was going to give 40 acres and a mule to be a part of this capitalistic society. And that never happened. In fact, the only form of reparations that happened for formerly in, in, in reference to the slave trade was, or slavery in America, was when uh, slave owners in Washington, DC were actually paid as much as $300 per slave mm. that they lost due to emancipation. So slave owners were So given we did reparations. have reparations in America. Right, for what they lost. <laughs> the okay. And so in 1862, the beginning of the Homestead Act, that gave in, in the south and west of the Mississippi, it gave 270 million acres of land mm. to 1.6 million white families, mostly white families. Mm -hmm. This was the Homestead Act, and it was virtually for free. Mm -hmm. And that not the estimates today are that about 46 million whites are benefiting financially from the Homestead Act, which gave mm -hmm. land to them for free. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's more than the entire population of African Americans in the country today. Mm -hmm. So there, there was the Homestead Act. Again, free land given to whites, including European immigrants, west of the Mississippi and also in the South. Then you go to the Social Security Act in 1935, where we know how beneficial Social Security is for everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, at that time, domestics, 
and farmers were left out of Social Security. Most African Americans by far were either domestics working in, in the houses of white people as housekeepers or farmers. So that was a, a way to discriminate against African Americans without saying black. And mm -hmm. so that worked mainly for whites and not for blacks. The Wagner Act where unions were created and we know the benefits of unions, Ruslan, you know, mm -hmm. pensions, uh, benefits, uh, all of that stuff that, that unions give, they, they created the unions, but allowed the unions to discriminate against blacks and basically mm. keep blacks out of the unions. So mm. while whites were getting these benefits, blacks weren't. Mm. And then you, you go to the GI Bill mm. after World War II from 1946 to 1952. Most white GIs received the benefits of the GI Bill, which was free education, uh, free home, you know, low interest home mortgages, you know, all the benefits that come with the GI Bill. And yet most of the 2 million African Americans who had fought in World War II were denied those benefits of the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. Then you go to the Federal Housing Administration loans. Okay, from 1934 to 1962, $120 billion of government backed low interest mortgage loans were given to whites. 98% of the people that received these loans were white Americans. This is how we built the nice white suburbs here in America. And those suburbs had contracts or covenants that they called them where they could not, even if you wanted to sell your house to an African American, you couldn't. Mm. Okay. Low interest government guaranteed loans to create the white suburbs. And yet, so blacks couldn't move into those suburbs. And then the black neighborhoods, on top of discriminating against blacks who wanted to move, they redlined the black neighborhoods, which meant that you couldn't, most families in those neighborhoods could not get home mortgages or home insurance. Mm. And if you did get it, the interest rates were sky high because of redlining. Yeah. It's been estimated that the average African-American family has lost two hundred and twelve thousand dollars because mm. of redlining mm. and so those are just ways yeah. that whites have been given advantages that blacks have not only been not given but actually been discriminated against uh for, lastly i'll say this because a lot of people will mention affirmative action that began in the 60s right mm -hmm. and i benefited from affirmative action my family mm -hmm. my father was in the he was a college graduate first in his family in that first line of African-Americans who were given corporate jobs. Now he was qualified, he graduated with a business degree and all that, mm -hmm. but he got a job in corporate America and I benefited from that, okay? But on the whole, affirmative action, which initially the thinking was this is for blacks to repair what the wrong that was done, it ended up being for blacks, other people of color, white women, and in fact, white women have benefited more from affirmative action than black people have. And white women tend to be married to white men. Mm -hmm. And so the white family overall has benefited financially from affirmative action more than the black family. Mm -hmm. And so those are all some of the post-slavery examples mm -hmm. of benefits that whites have received that blacks in large part have. Yeah. And, and the important part here is for anybody that knows anything about um, uh, financial literacy, microeconomics, the most direct path to building wealth is home ownership. Yeah. And if you have a history of a community being prevented from owning homes, uh, it, it, it compounds over time. And, and we didn't even touch on the war on drugs and the, right. the, the, the cheap right. cocaine flooding, you know, urban city streets, uh, fairly well documented to fight an illegal war in South America against communism and then mass incarceration, the war on drugs, over pump punishing. I mean, there's people in prison right now, right now, uh, doing 16 years for having three grams of crack on them today. There's over 3,500 people in prison today who have nonviolent crimes. There are people in prison right now for selling weed in states where it's now legal to sell right. weed. <laughs> right. How does any of right. that make sense, right? So what I th what I think the the, the, the and, pushback is- And let me is, say this, Ruslan, quickly, not to cut you off. Go ahead. But what you're saying, what 
the combination of what I just said and what you just said, mm -hmm. when you combine that with some of like, again, the people that were applauding me early on in the podcast, right? Mm -hmm. You combine all of those aspects of the Bible because they're all biblically based. Mm -hmm. When you call out an, an unfair war on drugs, you're not being racial or in, you're being biblically based. You're mm -hmm. hungering and thirsting for righteousness. If we as a church as the whole spoke like that, then I believe we'd start a spiritual awakening. Really, yeah. that, that mi most of us want to see in this country. But because we're divided and half of us say this part. And, and rail against the other part that's in the Bible. And half of us say this part and rail against the other part that's in the Bible. We're divided. And as Jesus said, a house divided can't stand. Yeah, that's good. And by the way, guys, when we're talking about this, what, 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 what the only picture I, I want people to understand is... Uh, I am a free market guy. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm, I'm about uh, empowering people through financial literacy, through education, through technology. What the, the point that we're making is that there have been different pathways based on history. And if you think that the, the situations today just happen in a vacuum and that policies from 60 years ago or eight, the 1980s don't affect people today, I think is uh, is is just astonishing to think that there's no connection to what happens generationally, um, and so let's 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 talk about let's talk about the the biblical reasons because I think a lot of people are gonna be like that's fine, Chris, but how do you justify this scripturally? And then I want to talk about some potentials of how uh, because the how people people get in the weeds on the how and there's all kinds of hows. So talk about some of the the the, the, the just the scriptural framework of what it, restorative justice means. And let me, before I get there, let me give you this, because a lot of people, find, which is understandably, will look at African-Americans, even look at myself and say, well, Chris is doing fine. He's on TV, he's making money, all this and that. But as you said, the generations, things that happened in the past affect us today. Mm -hmm. And a, a, all the things I mentioned, and then some, have created a wealth gap between black and white where the, the average white family has eight times more wealth than the average black family. And mm -hmm. as you said, that's generational. That's mm -hmm. not based on income. Mm -hmm. That's based on generate. When I, when my parents die, I will, because they own their house, I'll benefit from that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that will benefit my children. That's yep. building wealth. Yep. And so um, it, it's not just based on income. And then here's the last thing. A white family in America led by someone who has nothing more than a high school diploma has more wealth than a black family on average led by someone with a master's degree. Mm -hmm. So that's where you show you can make a lot of income, but if you don't have wealth, then you you're you're, you're it's going to be hard for you to handle the hardships of life, a mm -hmm. pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. losing a job, things like that. So. That is one uh, critical thing today where we've been affected by the past. And that's what we'd like to, uh, the, the, the thing, reparations would go a long way in helping in that regard. Um, but as far as the biblical case for reparations, uh, it, it, there's no doubt it's there. I mean, we could start with the New Testament story of Zacchaeus and how Zacchaeus, we know he, he became a Christian, he got saved. And he said to Jesus, look, I, I'm, 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 I'm paraphrasing, but I'm following you now, Lord. And I've, as, as proof, if you will, all the people that I've wronged, I have gone back and I have given them not only what I took from them, but four times that amount. And Jesus said, in reference to what Zacchaeus said, today salvation has come to you. So he was saying, this is fruit. You're bearing fruit now of mm -hmm. your salvation. So mm -hmm. that's one individual example. But you go to the Old Testament and in Exodus chapter 12, when the children of Israel are, are leaving Egypt, God tells them, you know, the, tells Moses to go tell the Egyptians that you want articles of silver and gold and clothing. When you leave, we did, you can't just go out of here empty handed. They have to give you stuff so you can survive and begin to build your nation up. And in verse 36 of Exodus 12, the Bible says the Lord caused the Egyptians to give the children of Israel the reparations or the articles of silver and gold that they asked for. 
uh, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 15, it talks about when Hebrew men and women were enslaved that you have to, when they, when their slavery is over, their term, if you will, six or seven years of working for you is over. Don't send them away empty handed. It says, give them liberally, supply them liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, from your wine press so that they can go out and, and again, start a new life, if you will, with the op with good opportunities and the things they need to do this. And, re and this is Hebrew, Hebrew slaves. Now, you'll notice, Ruslan, there, was, there were laws that Christians couldn't enslave Christians for whites. Mm -hmm. But once it became race-based child of slavery in America, they ended those laws and said, no, nah, you know what? Christians can't enslave other Christians. That would get you saved and get your soul to heaven, but it won't impact your station here on earth as a slave. Mm -hmm. And so that's another example. You can go to Numbers uh, chapter 5 where it talks about, you know, any man or woman who's wronged another, uh, they have to go back and make full restitution for the wrong that they've done. And in fact, add a fifth of the value to it to, to give to the people that you've wronged. Proverbs 14, 9 says, fools mock, fools mock at making reparation, but there is goodwill among the upright. So all yeah. of those are just some biblical examples Ruslan, where the Bible promotes this notion of reparations. We, we know in Matthew, I believe it is, it says, if your brother has re ought against you, don't go and, you know, give to the Lord, but stay, instead go back and make amends with your brother and then come and give to the Lord. So yeah. there yeah. we... You know, those are a few examples. I yeah, believe. I think I think the pushback then becomes, well, Chris, uh, why do white people today have to pay for something their ancestors did? And I think this is where people will miscategorize and take some of the I would call poor uh, anti-racist training. And then they become anti anti-racist because they like read a, a chapter from Robin D'Angelo's book. And so <laughs> what we're not talking about is we're not talking about white shame. We're not talking about white guilt. We're not talking about taking money out of white people's pockets and giving it to black people. That's, that's not, that is not what it, we're talking about. There are corporations, uh, quite a few of them around today that, that were benefiting and, 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 and built from chattel slavery 150 years ago that that's that's i mean that's just a fact so there's banks and you guys can look this up look up corporations around today that benefited most from, from of the banks slavery. today yeah most Wells of the banks Fargo, today JP Morgan, you know e either yeah. them or their predecessors yes yes yeah so and, and so when we talk about this it's it's i i don't think the heart of this is hey any white people should feel ashamed and guilty because uh your ancestors could have done this or whatever it, i think it's to say hey there are these disparities that are historical th that have played out and created very different outcomes for, for, for a group of people that have been discriminated against and other groups of people that are not And a lot of times we also gotta be careful with like, what about other minorities? I, I just wanna say this real quick, Chris. When you're talking about other minorities or if we compare folks from Jamaica or for folks coming from Ghana or folks in there, you have to factor in that you're getting some of the best of the best of people that literally are able to afford to immigrate here and that they're crushing it because you're not just getting average or lower class. You're getting some of the brightest, smartest people coming immigrating here so yes they are going to outperform now uh chris the, the, uh, the uh, another pushback is going to be well chris what about culture because fatherlessness and black on black crime it's all about culture let's you know it, it, it people black people just have a corrupt culture uh how do you respond to that yeah let, let's hit all of them um i think what was the first pushback you gave um oh taking it, money I, yeah i'm with look I'm not trying to make any white people feel guilty. This is not about that at all. And, and I agree, it's not about white shame, it's not about, about white guilt or anything like that. It's just about a fact uh, in this country. You know, now, we're unique. You know, you talk about the Holocaust, which took place obviously in Germany, and Jews over here, they, they're out of the country. They're not at the quote unquote scene of the crime. We're in a country where black Americans who were enslaved here, the descendants are still here. And, and so 
Um, it's we're it's a unique experiment that America is trying. And so we're saying, let's try to fix this racial issue once and for all. And I think one of the things that reparations provides is closure. Because mm. I think blacks and whites want closure on this thing. Like, we want to be able to move on. Like, look, the race issue isn't, let's get moved past it. And I get it that there are other things. I mean, there are many types of reparations, you know, you can look at uh, programs, uh, cash checks, whatever. But I'm saying if if reparations was a is accompanied by uh, teaching the truth in schools, uh, by um, you know other opportunity like for instance today uh, white predominantly white school districts in America receive 23 billion dollars more for their education than predominantly black or school districts of color. $23 billion more. And let's face it, most of the predominantly white school districts are out in nice neighborhoods, most of them, not all, but in, in white suburbs where they're nice neighborhoods and the people have more money. And most of the black or people of color school districts are in more poor, poor neighborhoods. So people who already have advantages mm -hmm. and economic advantage are getting a better education. And so that's even more of an advantage. And I, look, mm -hmm. my kids, obviously I'm doing well. I trained my kids to tutoring for SAT prep and all that. And I'm not, it wasn't fair. My kids went to elite schools, get, got tutoring for their SAT. And I know when I was a kid, I rolled into the SAT on Saturday morning with no training, no nothing. I just mm -hmm. took it off the cuff. And so it's not fair. So my point is, that's something else that needs to be rectified. So I think it should be equal money spent on education, regardless of where you live or what your economic mm -hmm. status is in public schools. Now, yeah. so so I think to, to your point, it's not about white guilt or shame and it's not about taking money from individual whites. To me, it's about the government and it's about individual, as you mentioned, corporations, which could do things uh, white banks that had benefited from slavery could sh give some of their money to black owned banks or give more loans to African Americans and African Americans businesses. And you say, what well, a credit for some of these individuals is so bad. Well, yeah, when you live in check to check for generations, yeah, your credit's probably going to be bad. And so we need to make, you know, allowances for things like that. And then you go to schools. Most schools, most of the schools in the Ivy League, most American schools that were created before the Civil War benefited from slavery. Mm -hmm. So let's say Harvard, for instance. Harvard mm -hmm. has an endowment and has admitted it benefited from slavery, has mm -hmm. an endowment of $40 billion. Mm -hmm. That's 13 times the endowment of all 100 plus historically black colleges and universities in the country. Mm -hmm. They have an endowment of roughly $3 billion. Harvard has four, 40 billion. What if Harvard just gave 3% of its endowment to say Howard University, mm -hmm. uh, one of the top HBCUs? That in and of itself would be huge. And that would allow Howard to become even an even greater school if Yale gave 3% to Spelman. Now you still, how Harvard would still have 37 billion. So mm -hmm. you're gonna be fine, but yeah. this is repairing the damage that was done. That's those are a couple of examples yeah. that wouldn't harm white individuals. Now to get to black culture, of course, yes, blacks make mistakes. Blacks do, do do things that are wrong, but so does everyone else. And I believe, to some degree, to a large degree, not in every case though, there have been a there's been a safety net to catch whites when they they make their mistakes, and not it doesn't catch blacks. Uh, mm -hmm. Blacks in a lot of cases, haven't been able to afford to make a mistake. You know, you got to live this totally clean cut, great life to, to succeed. And so um, fatherlessness, let's go there. Number one, we need to stop making fatherlessness a racial issue. Mm -hmm. Because if we go, let's be honest, if we go back to the antebellum South, white men were enslaving their own children. Mm -hmm. Right? Having sex, raping the black slave women to create more slaves, and then enslaving their own children. 
Mm-hmm. So let's not, I, and, and there's also been studies to show that, yes, fatherlessness as far as black kids born with two parents in the household who are married is out of control. And I'll be the first to admit that, and I, I work to rectify that. It's, a, mm-hmm. it's above 70%, which is unacceptable. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are also studies that show that black fathers, even if they're out of the house, are more involved with mm-hmm. their children. So mm-hmm. let's not just act like it is a, a black thing, even as we need to do better in that regard. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are other factors that have impacted the fatherlessness as well. One of them is, and some of this is stuff the Democrats have pushed, mm-hmm. you know, but one of mm-hmm. them is sending a lot of the jobs overseas, mm-hmm. right? The, the factory jobs and manufacturing jobs, because those were jobs that, a man, regardless of race, mm-hmm. uh, with regardless of his education or lack mm-hmm. thereof, could go and get a good job with benefits, right, for his family and raise his family and, and, and you know, and start, you know, protect, provide for his family. Those jobs now being overseas, that's been one contributor. The, as you mentioned, the war on drugs, mass incarceration, that has been a huge factor in fatherlessness because you're taking father like studies show blacks use and sell drugs at the same rate as whites mm-hmm. yep. so blacks don't do it any more than whites do even, right. even selling drugs even though the poster child for drug dealing is a black dude in the hood yep. you know and so but blacks are 13 times more likely according to human rights watch to go to prison or jail for yep. a drug related offense Yep. So you you're you something that you're not punishing whites for in general, you're punishing blacks for by sending them to jail and taking a father out of the home or a potential yep. father out of the home. And yep. if he's a young man, when he comes back, he's got a record, his education's been disrupted, and it's gonna be difficult for him to provide for his family. So yeah. those are some of the things that contribute. And I'm not saying we don't have responsibility. Part of it is man up. And, mm-hmm. and be a father to your child. Do whatever mm-hmm. you got to do to mm-hmm. provide for that child. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that's not the only part. Yes. And so um, we, you just mentioned the crack crisis. Well, there's an opioid crisis now. It's not being treated the same way. It's Come being on. treated properly. Sympathetic. Yes. Let's get the kids in rehab. We yep. feel for them. Yep. Where When it was blacks on crack, mm. oh, it was punishment. It was, yeah. it was, you know, throw these thugs in jail. So... Those are some of the things um, when you talk yeah. about culture, blacks aren't using yeah. selling drugs more than white. Most drugs, fine, I'll end with this. You know this, there are more, I went to a good college, Oberlin College. There's more drugs being done on the college campuses and yep. in corporate America, on Wall Street, than in the hood. Yep. But yep. we're, not th- fo- we're not trying to arrest those people, right? We're not yeah. focusing on that. We focusing <laughs> on poor people, even poor whites. Yeah. In yeah. 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 And, and and I think that's the part that people also don't don't quite factor in is some of this is also connected to class. And so poor whites do get treated harshly under the law right. for the, some of the same reasons. It's just a lot of times black people are more likely to be in poverty because oftentimes poverty begets poverty. And I think for me, logically, I think you got you got to really think through this and say, hey, um, like you, you, you really have one of two options in terms of how you view the, the issue. And then I want to get into some solutions, but you can view the issue to say, hey, you know what? Maybe there's different pathways. Maybe the, the laws for 50, 60, 120, you know, 20 years ago impact people today. And maybe that's why we see so many disparities. And and when we start talking about choices and personal responsibility, that's those aren't like objectively conservative values. That's like human right. values, like nuclear right. family, uh, hard work. Those aren't like black people just don't got hard work. <laughs> like, so what you're doing is you're, you, you have to ignore all the history and all the pathways and really just say, well, well black people just got a corrupt culture, which I think is wildly offensive to just d- d- deduce it to, well, black people just got a corrupt culture or they're on the democratic plantation i think it's i think it's what builds culture what builds fatherlessness what builds the what what creates more crime what creates poverty right and it's not just as simple as well just pull yourself up by your bootstraps i think it's right. more nuanced than that and that's kind of what you talked about let's talk about some solutions chris this may be the only part where me and you may disagree on um i think there needs to be something done i don't know what i don't know how it plays out 
I'm not l- waiting on the government to fix it. I think the government is wildly inefficient. I think the government is wildly bureaucratic. And I just don't think they're, they've really, I think it's a lot of virtue signaling. I think even folks that wanna have this conversation in Washington, they're not really about doing something. I mean, l- listen, Trump was trying to do the platinum plan last year, right? And it was like, if you don't think that, the, 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 I mean, that, that was what, uh, almost a trillion dollars, right? It's like a form of 500, reparation. 500 billion, right? Yeah, $500 billion. Like, so to say that there's not an issue, but what I think is some of it is pandering and some of it is just looking, boy, my, my solution, this is my solution, is when we talk about fatherlessness, those of you guys that are watching here and that want to point out fatherlessness, hey, why don't you be a father to some fatherless children? Why don't you adopt kids? Why don't you go be a mentor? Why don't you go serve in your local youth ministry? Why, right? Because that's I, I'm taking ownership of that, and I'm taking responsibility for my nieces who didn't grow up with their father, for my nephews that didn't grow up with their father. I'm going to be that father. I'm going to be that male role model for folks who don't have the access to information or the access to how execute something. I'm going to be that person and step in, not on some like bizarre white savior complex, but like on Matthew 25, like hey, care for the least of these care for care for the orphan care for the widow so i i i think the solution to me is hey man like we all have to step up so if you're here and your heart is broken uh because of fatherlessness are you doing any like are you really doing anything about fatherlessness are you just complaining if you're if you really care about the unborn are you doing anything to help single mothers who don't don't know if they could afford to bring a, a child into this world like are you actually doing something and i know people are but that would be my pushback and i think a lot of this from the church could be mitigated that way. I'm with you in that there needs to be an acknowledgement, that there needs to be an apology. Um, I'm just so apathetic to the government doing it, doing anything. What are your thoughts right. on the how of this, how this could be? Like, are we talking, you said funding for uh, historically black colleges, um, maybe more after school programs, access to capital. How, how could this practically play out from your perspective? Yeah, and and I, you, you mentioned the platinum plan that that Ice Cube, you know, he did his contract with Black mm-hmm. America, Ice Cube, the former rapper or the rapper. Uh, he and he he his people were pushed Trump to, to create that platinum plan mm-hmm. or at least uh, up the money in it. And I was talking, I worked with Ice Cube on his the contract with Black America and, and all of that stuff. Mm. Um, and there's many there's many different ways to to look at it. Some some African-Americans feel like there should be a cash like Bob Johnson is like give us fourteen trillion dollars in cash. Yeah, I've That's seen that number thrown around. Is, right, right. Yeah. Now, and the theory is that because most people hear that number, they're like, "That's ridiculous. We can't do that." Mm-hmm. Yet in two thousand eight, for the corporate and bank bailout, the estimates are that it was about seven and a half trillion dollars that the government gave out. Wow. And then for the bailout, in, or I'm, I'm sorry, between seven and a half trillion. And twenty nine trillion. Those for are the where two, the for the o, for the right. 08, for the 08 bailouts for, the, for cor- wow. yes for corporations and banks. And then wow. you go to the bailout in twenty twenty with the pandemic, and that was four trillion. Mm. So the government could do it, mm. and you said it. I mean, there's red tape and there's Republican, Democrat, all that stuff. So I, we in working with Ice Cube, we talked with Andrew Young, and mm. Andrew Young did say, "Look, you need it needs to be the private sector." Mm-hmm. Because Andrew Young, the former, you know, ambassador and, and all that stuff, uh, mm-hmm. civil rights icon. And he said private sector is easier to get it done through. So that's where I mentioned the colleges, the universities, the, the banks, you know, yeah. if they even corporations could set up management trainee programs for black college graduates with the goal being we're going to get roughly thir- assuming we do the job well, 13 percent of our management and training or in executive population in our corporation will be African-American in 10 years or 15 mm-hmm. years or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Things like that. And I say that because I believe that we have examples where for the most part, many white Americans will not hire African-Americans in, in representative numbers unless forced to. Mm. And the greatest example is the NFL. Mm. The NFL is obviously dominated by African-American athletes. 70% of the players are black. Mm. And yet very few of the coaches and general managers are Mm African-Americans. Now on the field, 
it, it is a complete meritocracy. But in the coaching ranks, in the executive ranks, there are a lot of different people who can do the job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's where the racism comes in more. So mm -hmm. because white owners and executives haven't been forced to hire a certain number of African-American coaches mm -hmm. or executives, they haven't done it. And mm -hmm. they're, they're hiring white coaches who don't have near the qualifications of many of the black coaches that are being passed over. That's why I say I don't necessarily want a quota, but you, a goal should be roughly 13% mm -hmm. because that's the population of the African Americans. When I talk about some of these banks and colleges and universities and, mm -hmm. and things like that, um, some of it could be cash. I mentioned the equal pay per student education. So if we live in New Jersey and we got 1 million public school students of all races, all classes, mm -hmm. each student, and we got $10 million to divide it up, then each student, gets the same amount of money spent on their public education. Private mm -hmm. schools are a different matter, but public yep. education, the kid in the hood, regardless of his race, gets as much money spent on his school and yep. education as the kid in the ritziest suburb. Yep. And so th some of the, those are some things, you mentioned some individual things, which I think are great that we all should be doing, but I also think there are ways that the private sector and government can get involved in a massive way. Now, let me say this about the churches. I think that churches should try to begin working together across the racial and economic lines. Mm -hmm. So big churches in the suburbs need to be able to work with churches in the inner city to create schools yeah. that can teach Christian values. And this is beyond just reparations, but that can teach Christian values because if white and black Christians unite with other Christians of color, mm -hmm. then the race card can't as easily be played on white evangelicals. Like people don't, Ruth, you people don't generally want to hear from white evangelicals right now, mm -hmm. right? They, they, mm -hmm. That's almost whether it's right or not, yeah. it's almost synonymous with racist. Mm -hmm. If you go went on CNN tonight and they put a, a, a beneath your name white evangelical. <laughs> a lot of people don't just write you off as racist without even listening to you, right? Yeah. And so, and, and I also think that white colleges, I've spoken at many white, well, Christian colleges, I've spoken at mm -hmm. many Christian colleges, mm -hmm. they are overwhelmingly white, very little mm -hmm. black representation other than mm -hmm. maybe some athletes. Mm -hmm. They, to me, they should go out of their way to have a, a strong recruiting effort of students of color who aren't mm -hmm. athletes. African Americans and other students of color to bring their diversity up. And they also need to hire hire diverse people in the faculty and the administration and change the curriculum. And I don't get into the whole critical race theory thing. I'm about truth. Yeah. Teach the truth. Yeah. You know, I'm not about trying to shame white people. I'm not worried about triggers and all that. I'm worried about truth. And that's why this you mentioned Robin D'Angelo and a lot of this stuff is all it's this this stuff about triggers and how you speak to an African American, make sure you don't offend it. Ruslan, I'm gonna keep it real with you. I don't care if a white person doesn't like me. Mm. I don't care if they don't like me because I'm black. I care when you have the power and the resources to hinder or ruin my life because yeah. of your prejudice. Yep. So I'm not worried about you triggering me or whatever. White America benefited tangibly and financially from its racism. So the answer to fix it are tangible financial fixes. It's not mm. about a documentary. It's not about a, a, an exhibit. It's not about, you know, just be nice to black people. No, give us the tangible and financial losses that we, we had that you were given to, to rectify the situation. Yeah. And I and and so and when you if you guys were really listening, like 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 actually listening, uh a lot of what Chris said uh wasn't just we'll just send everybody money. We just going to send everybody money. Like he laid out multiple potential policy changes uh that could be implemented. Um, and he's saying, yeah, let's not take sending money off the table, but here are all these other things that could be 
um, you know, done to mitigate some of this stuff. So whether you are not, you agree fully, hopefully at the very least we can acknowledge that there has been a historical problem. And I think a lot of this, honestly, Chris, I think folks just aren't really ready to have that conversation yet. I think folks really aren't really ready to acknowledge the different pathways that were created historically. And then that's where this tension, before we could even get on to solutions, we're just, we can't even have a genuine conversation about like the problem. <laughs> like because, the pro be, because you're right, because we can't, we don't agree on the origin of the problem. Right. And, and I would say this, Ruslan, I think white Americans in general are miseducated about the history of America. Mm. Uh, and I think white Christians are the most miseducated mm -hmm. because white Christians, whether you go back to the Daughters of the Confederacy or the Lost Cause, all of that stuff that was created by the Southern Baptists out of slavery, mm -hmm. um, they, they, buy, they have totally bought into this notion that America was this great, fabulous Christian country. It was the mm -hmm. city on the hill. It mm -hmm. was, you know, a um, uh, 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 manifest destiny and and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. It was the kingdom of God here on earth, you know. And slavery was just like a little blind spot. Mm -hmm. And African Americans are like, no, we look, we love America. Mm -hmm. We fought for America just as much as everybody else. We're not, we're not, we don't hate America, but we're saying. That is not true. And, and if you take race out of it, Ruslan, if you just look at how people born in America were treated during that time, they happened to be black, but they were just Americans, period. Mm -hmm. If you just look at that, and then even the discrimination after slavery, how in the world can you say that's Christian? And I think white Christians do the church a major disservice when they associate American history with Christ or with Christianity, because mm. you're associating racism, slavery, castration, rape, discrimination, oppression. You're associating all of that with Christianity. Mm. And, and people of color and even mainstream whites or liberal whites are saying, man, I don't want that. Yeah. I don't want that. If that's Christianity, we don't want it. Yeah. And so let's just be honest about the Bible and American history, because I think that's how we can move forward. It's going to take the truth spoken in love to move forward. You said a lot of people don't want to have the conversation. Then we're going to we're going to be revisiting this 20 years from now, mm. just like yeah. we did 20 years ago and 20 years before that. And it's not going to get better. And ultimately that and many other things, I think, are going to put this country in a bad place. Yeah, that's good. Chris, any final thoughts before you get out of here? I know you got to wrap. Man, um, thanks for having me. Um, it's a deep conversation. It's hard to cover in one fell swoop. Um, but like I said, my, my heart is just that the church, the world's going to be the world, but that the church would unite black, white, uh, people of all races and ethnicities, that we would be able to unite to the degree that we can on a kingdom of God agenda. Mm -hmm. One that, yes, that includes whatever on the right is biblical mm -hmm. and one that includes whatever on the left is biblical. And it leaves out all the rest. If we would unite on that and promote that, then I believe that we could spark a revival, the revival that I think all Bible based Christians want to have want to have in this country and feel this country needs to have. If we don't, if we remain divided based on race, based on class, all that, then I think the, the way the direction is going, obviously God can do whatever he wants, but I think Christians in the church, we're being pushed to the periphery and yeah. we're being pushed more and more underground. Because we're just not really willing to talk about the hard things. We're, we 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 rather just remain polarized and divisive instead of saying, hey, let's have more conversations like this. That's why I love seeing you on uh, Dr. Michael Brown's channel. Completely surprised me because uh, he tends to be more on the religious right, right side of things. You know, so I was very proud of him and just affirmed him uh, for having you on. Uh, and I definitely got to have you back on, Chris. I know you got to go. Um, this has been fun. 
Uh, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to hang out for a little bit here with uh, some of the folks that are in the chat. But uh, we got to have you back on, man, um, to talk further about this and uh, maybe a little bit long form because I think there's 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 a lot of there's a lot here. There's a lot of nuance here, yeah. and, and and we just need to just listen and be humble. Um, and and to say that, like, I don't think Chris is saying here why he has all the solutions. I, I think none of us are claiming anything right. like that. I, th I think we're. Um, but like just let's just acknowledge what's happened and then look, let's look through ways of how we can um, we, we can mitigate some of this. My next uh, event got pushed back a few minutes. So if you want, we can go maybe another 10. Max. OK, cool. Uh, hey, let me give me let me but give I you can answer some questions. If people. Have yeah, yeah. Questions. Let's do questions. Like let's that. do questions. I think that the thing is great. This is this. Here's the deal. Chris is going to be gracious enough, guys, to stay. I wasn't expecting him to stay. We were supposed to wrap five minutes ago. So thank you. Let's do this. <laughs> if you have a question, write question in capital and I'm going to put it on the screen and then Chris is going to answer some of your guys' questions. I'm, I'm so grateful for him doing this and uh, and we're, we're going to unpack some. So just write questions in all capitals. We're going to do kind of like a rapid fire uh, question and answer thing. I just want to say one thing before we get into questions. Uh, guys, those of you guys that are like, what about LeBron? What about Oprah? Look up survivorship bias. Um, you, you, you can't look at because Barack became president, because this person became president or because this that uh, that now that becomes comes the standard for all the people that are struggling and hurting. That is an actual concept in psychology called uh, called uh, survivorship bias. So I, I want you guys to, uh, to to look that up on your own. All right, let's jump into some questions. I think uh, here's here's another thing quickly on that, Ruslan. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think reparations is about closure, fairness, and justice. Okay. And it, it's not, it, yes, many African-Americans need reparations, but it's not just based on need. Example. If I go steal $1 million from LeBron James, now mm -hmm. LeBron James is nearly a billionaire, but if mm -hmm. I steal a million dollars from him, are we going to say, LeBron don't need it. He's good. Mm -hmm. Let Chris keep the million. Don't right. No. Justice demands that I give him back the million dollars and I, and I pay the price for it. So it's not just based on need, even though that's a big factor. Right. It's based on fairness and justice. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Let's jump into some of these questions. Uh, I'm trying to figure out, okay. Uh, here's here's a good one. Lincoln says, "Chris, uh, what do you love? Uh, why do you love America? Just curious, based upon your perspective of history, what has America gotten right?" It's a good question. Well, look, I, I I know Jesus Christ, and and I have a good family, and so I, I've I've enjoyed my life. Mm. Um, that doesn't, but I also understand America's the world, mm. right? So even as a Christian, I could say, America's the world. And we're told not to love the world. If I, if you want, you know, I think he's challenging me on, well, if you love America, then why are you, you know, bringing up these negatives about it? Just mm -hmm. because something may, there may be negatives, doesn't mean you don't make the best of your life and you can't even enjoy it, you know? Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to get things right so we don't have to keep revisiting this racial issue. Mm -hmm. And so what has America gotten right? Um, I'll say this, even though I, I push back against the notion that America is a Christian country mm -hmm. because of the way people were treated, people of color, African-Americans, Native Americans, you can't deny that there were America, a, that America had somewhat of a worldview that was based on Judeo-Christian principles, right? Mm -hmm. And God, we trust on the dollar bill, uh, 10 commandments in the courtroom, and even though white America was not following those commandments mm -hmm. uh, when it came to the treatment of people of color, the mm -hmm. fact that there was a respect for the Bible and mm -hmm. a respect for those commandments allowed for changes to be made. The changes we've yeah. had. Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King, they all the black freedom fighters fought for black freedom freedom and liberation based on those biblical values based yeah. on the bible and they said america you claim to follow this bible the bible says this so treat us better if yeah. america had no respect for the bible then african americans martin luther king could have quoted scriptures all he wanted to and it wouldn't would not have mattered it wouldn't have affected anybody they would have said so what that book doesn't matter and so the fact that america had a i'll say a respect for the bible even as it didn't follow it necessarily um in many when it came to people of color 
I think that created even the Declaration of Independence, right? And, and, and it, that created in the Constitution, all men are created equal, right? We know that they, those were good words, but it wasn't applied to people of color. But yet, because those words were on paper, African-American freedom fighters and, and whites who fought for black freedom could yeah. point to those words and say, live up to what you said on paper and live up to what you said in the what it says in the Bible. And so that's something that creates a, a opportunity for change. It has created great change, but there's still more change that needs to be done. Yeah, that's good. Uh... Uh, trying to, there's a lot of questions here. Uh, I wasn't born in the USA. Why should I deserve reparations? I, don't know I, I think should. when you talk about, <laughs> right, when you talk about black reparations, I think you're talking about Africans, Americans, yeah. who are descendants, descendants of, of slaves. slaves. Yeah. I don't and think then <laughs> I think you go up to, you, you can go up to, I'd say, either African or Caribbean immigrants who came maybe in the up to 1950s or 60s, because I mentioned a lot of the, the Homestead Act, the Federal Housing Administration law, all of these other forms of discrimination that did include blacks that came at that time. But yeah. you're talking about Nigerians coming over here in 1980 or today. No, I, I don't think they should get yes. the reparations. Now, maybe you go to Britain, you go yeah. to the European nations that colonized Nigeria or colonized you know, or enslaved uh, blacks in the Caribbean. Those nations could pay reparations. But in America, we're strictly talking about African-Americans or or immigrants, black immigrants, up into the 1950s, somewhere around there. I'm going to get into another challenging one. So this is interesting. In 1960, the out-of-wedlock birth rate was under 25% for African-American communities. Now, as conditions have vastly improved, the number is nearly 75%. What do you account for the increase? I think, as I said, one is a lot of the jobs, not, not in order. This isn't mean this is the most important one. But I think a lot of the jobs going overseas, the factory and manufacturing jobs going overseas. Mm -hmm. So you, you took away a lot of jobs that African-Americans could get because the employment rate for black American men was much better back then, too. All right. Mm -hmm. Secondly, welfare. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you push black men out of the house so that they could get the check, you know, the women could get the check. So that's one of it. Two, I think three, the sexual revolution. The mm. nation as a whole has become much more promiscuous. Mm -hmm. You know, so so <laughs> things that back then weren't, you know, it just wasn't a part of our society. It had to be done real quietly. We as a nation are much more sexually promiscuous of, across all racial lines. Yep. So that's another thing. And then I say the war on drugs, as we talked about in mass incarcerations, where a lot of black men are in prison and jail because of drug use mm -hmm. where a lot of whites who use the drugs either aren't even arrested in the first place mm -hmm. in corporate America, college campuses, or if they are, they're not sent to jail for it. Not all, yeah. but many. So yeah. I'd say yeah. those are four of the things that have contributed to it. And again, not taking away our responsibility, yeah. but there are other factors as well. Yeah. Uh, as it relates to your solutions, how would you feel about free education or trade school training followed by two years of federal tax exemption? So in it's free trade school, tech schools, how do you feel about that in terms of one of the solutions for, um, you know, for no, some I, of the I think that 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 looks like something that would certainly you would want to put on the table. Right. Mm -hmm. As a possible solution. As I said, I've got some examples of some things. I don't claim to have all the answers, but that certainly looks like something you would you know, that would be, um, you know, certainly want to at least put on the table for consideration. This is a good question. How would uh, how would reparations work within interracial marriage? This, I mean, I'm falling in this category. My wife is black. How would that work? <laughs> if your wife is a descendant of uh, American slaves, then you would get, she would, you know, you would get reparations. That's I mean, good. That's, uh, yeah, let me find. There was one a good one by Kid Casper. I think we can use kind of as, as a closer because I know we got I got a minute on the timer. Uh, oh gosh, where is it? There's so many questions. Sorry guys, um, you guys asked a lot of really good questions. Forgive me for not being able to get to all of them. Uh, here's a good one. Um, how do you reconcile being a black man but having to remember being a Christian first and a black man second? It's not hard to reconcile for me. I, I don't think it's any harder than it is for a white person or Asian or whatever your ethnicity is. Um, mm -hmm. I'm Christ first. 
<clears throat> um, and a lot, all the things I've said, I feel like are rooted in my Christian faith, you know, for fairness. We're, we're told, you, you brought up the uh, Beatitudes, Ruslan, earlier. Uh, we hunger for, for justice, for righteousness. Uh, we hunger for righteousness. And, and so I'm hungry for righteousness. I'm hungry for this racial situation to end, right? The, this disparity mm -hmm. between the races or this, this angst, if you will, between the races. Um, and so it, it's, I, I, I'm Christ first. Um, but part of who I, I, I was, God, see, I'm not, I don't believe in colorblindness. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we say, oh, I'm colorblind. I don't believe mm -hmm. that because God created us different colors. He created mm -hmm. us in different ethnicities. Part mm -hmm. of who I am is, is he created me as an African-American. He created you as a, as a European roots line, as a white man. And if I, if I have to like ignore that you're white or ignore that a person is Asian or Hispanic, to treat them with respect and mm. dignity and love them, then I got a problem. So be, it's not about being colorblind and ignore, oh, I didn't know LeBron James was black. I don't look at color. First of all, you're lying. You clearly <laughs> see he's black. Secondly, that shouldn't, you, you should be able to embrace his ethnicity and, and what God created him. He cre he's created in God's image. You're mm. created in God's image. I'm created in God's image regardless yep. of our ethnicity and we should be able to just love and respect people because we're all created in God's image for, yeah. regardless of race. That's good. That's it, guys. Hey, we'll get Yeah, yeah, we'll do a part 2 whenever whenever you have time. Guys, th uh go go send Chris some love on Twitter. You know, thank you so much for doing this conversation, man. This was really uh good. Hopefully uh Hopefully some of your hearts were softened and you're not just dismissing anybody that, that is for social justice as a Marxist. Woke. I don't know if you just picked the favorable questions, but those were at least, you know, those were um, good questions. Yeah. Chris, thank yeah. you so much, brother. I really appreciate you, man. We got to do this again. And uh, you guys, uh, go send Chris some love on social media, man. Thank you so much, Chris. All right, brother. Peace. We'll be in touch. Peace. Kingstream Entertainment. Bruce Lawn. Hey, thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. If you found it valuable, please consider giving it a like and subscribing. You can check out one of the other videos related to this that'll be over here. Now, I gotta tell you about a free training I have for anyone that is an entrepreneur, a creative, an artist, but maybe you are unsure on how to find your voice, how to find your niche. I have a free training in the description of this video. Check it out. Once again, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you, and I will see you on the next video.